It is my true pleasure to introduce my longtime colleague, Jeff Botkin, to address the national debates on research with human participants, issues and choices. We can get Jeff's slides up now. Uh, Jeffrey Botkin is Chief of the Division of Medical Ethics and Humanities, Associate Vice President for Research Integrity, and has oversight responsibilities for the Human Subjects Protection Program, as well as serving as Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Utah. He plays numerous national leadership roles. Among them, he is the current chair of the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Human Research Protections, alias SACHARP, at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. He's a member of the Food and Drug Administration's Pediatric Ethics Advisory Committee. He serves on the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children at DHHS. And he chairs the NIH's Embryonic Stem Cell Eligibility Working Group. He was also previously chair of the Committee on Bioethics for the American Academy of Pediatrics. He received his MD from the University of Pittsburgh, his MPH from Johns Hopkins. He's an elected fellow of the Hastings Center. And his own research focuses on the ethical, legal, and social implications of genetic technology with particular emphasis on research ethics, on genetic testing for cancer susceptibility, biobanking, newborn screening, and prenatal diagnosis. Jeff. Thank you, Susan, and thanks to the Planning Committee for uh, thinking of me for day, uh, today. Uh, certainly a privilege to be part of this uh, prestigious program and a privilege to be uh, uh, joining some outstanding faculty for the discussion today. So my title here, I have my uh, slide advancer. Here we go. Uh, if I could bring those slides up for me. So I'm going to give a little bit of a potpourri today about uh, uh, issues that I think are important in contemporary debate about human subject protection uh, programs. I'm going to touch on a variety of issues, and I think this is a particularly opportune time, uh, certainly because of the NPRM, which was uh, issued a couple months ago, uh, and now everybody is uh, uh, furiously, uh, I hope, preparing comments about uh, uh, this opportunity to change uh, the federal regulations for the first time in 25 years. So an extraordinary opportunity to be having this debate, and I think an extraordinary opportunity for a variety of reasons because of so many issues are becoming um, available and rich for uh, further discussion, in part because we've been so active in collecting data on a number of issues so that we have a much better uh, understanding of the complexities of some of these uh, topics. So I'm going to do a couple of things uh, uh, today. Um, case presentation to beginning, and it's going to be a very brief uh, case presentation uh, for you. And then I'm going to outline a couple of things. <clears throat> what I think are the pillars uh, of research uh, ethics. Uh, and then touch on what I think are a couple of contemporary issues uh, within each of those uh, particular pillars. And I hope this will foster some conversation among the, uh, the group and the folks on the webinar. Now, I'm not having uh, success with my slide advancer here. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. So, uh, here's the outline I had uh, uh, mentioned. And uh, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about IRB function issues, uh, informed consent. Uh, always a hot topic. Uh, potential participants who lack consent capacity, uh, and then finally some issues around investigator integrity. So here's my case. Uh, what would be called a thin description in the field. So you have 408 uh, inpatients with methicillin-resistant staph aureus, MRSA. And they're enrolled in a clinical trial to determine the relapse rate uh, after 10 days of intravenous uh, vancomycin. Patients recruited from uh, inner city hospitals for the trial and randomized uh, to either 10 days of vancomycin or symptomatic treatment. Now the results, 
Of the uh, 251 subjects who were uh, randomized to the vancomycin treatment, 20 patients died for a mortality rate of 8%. In the 157 subjects randomized to the symptomatic treatment group, 36 died for a mortality rate of 23%. So potentially scientifically interesting, uh, potentially valuable uh, information from this study. <clears throat> so pretty basic question. If we were having a, a class, we'd have some discussion about this uh, uh, issue. Do you see any ethical concerns with the design of this trial? Now, I forgot to mention, actually, that prior to the development of the trial, we actually knew uh, vancomycin worked. Not uniformly effective, but it's uh, uh, significantly effective. So in fact, we lacked equipoise in the design of the study. This is very similar, actually, to a case that I do work with with students around uh, um, asthma treatment and uh, placebo control for kids with uh, moderate asthma. That was also a very real study. <clears throat> so the question here is, did the IRB miss something in improving this trial? We see a fundamental problem with uh, uh, the oversight for this particular trial that would allow for such a dramatic difference in mortality rate between the uh, vancomycin treatment group uh, and the placebo or symptomatic treatment group. Where was the IRB? Or further, where was the uh, Data Safety Monitoring Board uh, in tracking the uh, the data through this study in order to uh, assess when the scientific uh, conclusions had been adequately uh, uh, drawn, not to allow the excess uh, deaths. Well, is this study familiar to anybody? You know, we might have expected somebody to hear about this study. <clears throat> well, in fact, this is a somewhat updated version of one of the studies that are part of Henry Beecher's famous publication uh, in 1966. This was a seminal publication that uh, uh, Beecher, as a, uh, a physician, sort of Brahmin of the um, uh, New England medical community, and himself quite instrumental in developing the whole concept of placebo controls, went through the literature, identified studies that he felt were uh, unethical. And the emphasis to a significant extent for Beecher was on the lack of informed consent that seemed to be a hallmark of many of these particular studies. Well, this is an update of, of uh, example number three that he developed. And example number three was uh, chloramphenicol for typhoid fever. It was known that chloramphenicol was effective for typhoid fever prior to the trial. They enrolled folks that in the study description were called uh, patients, uh, charity patients. And indeed, the numbers were as I presented with my uh, hypothetical case, uh, with an indication that 23 additional people died in the symptomatic treatment group compared to the uh, uh, intervention group. Now, it doesn't take much imagination to understand if those were your loved ones who had been uh, allocated to the symptomatic treatment, uh, allowed to die in the absence of effective treatment in order to demonstrate a principle that had already been demonstrated within the literature at that time. So Beecher wanted to make an important point. He had a significant impact, but not a transformational impact at the time. It really took the Tuskegee study uh, and the emergence or awareness of that uh, uh, events, set of events over uh, many years that that study represented, at a time when the, the nation was particularly sensitive about civil rights issues. It was the Tuskegee study that really blew the lid off the, uh, what were the contemporary oversight mechanisms for research at the time, which were extraordinarily limited. It was up to investigators themselves, largely to make determinations about what they thought uh, ethical conduct consisted of. So here's a, just a brief list, and many of you may have other examples of uh, contemporary studies for which there has been uh, controversy. Uh, the support study, uh, University of Utah was part of the support study. Many of you may be familiar with that. It was a study about uh, premature infants who are allocated to different levels of oxygen within the standard clinical range. Um, and uh, 
Uh, the results of the study uh, became uh, alarming to many folks, and the question really focused not so much on the design of the study itself, which many folks felt was appropriate, but on the nature of the informed consent that parents had been uh, offered. Were they adequately informed of the nature of that study? Enormous national controversy for uh, well over a year of that study. The other ones, uh, I'm not going to go into any detail uh, to discuss here, but the point I want to make with listing these studies uh, is the following. Many of these have been controversial due to the nature of the informed consent process itself. Now, the Jesse Gelsinger case is probably the one example, and that's the one on this list in which the young man, Jesse, died by virtue of the experimental uh, intervention. Then became uh, evident that there were some conflicts of interest, uh, both for the investigator and the institution who were involved in the study. And that study has had a significant impact on how we think and respond to uh, conflicts of interest in the conduct of biomedical uh, research. So some of these studies have had significant uh, impacts. But the point I want to make is that there is such a fundamental difference between the nature of controversial studies in this day and age and the type of studies that Henry Beecher revealed in his publication in 1966. I would say that there has been a revolutionary change in the nature, certainly, of oversight and in the conduct, the ethical conduct of human subjects research over that period of time. So here's my contention. <clears throat> the peer review system, the IRB system, uh, as we know it uh, today, has been extraordinarily successful. I am a big advocate of the system that we've developed, not with all of the warts. Every system has some warts, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those uh, uh, challenges. <clears throat> but my contention here uh, is that the IRB system has virtually eliminated systematic breaches of ethical standard in the conduct of human subjects research. And this is a tribute to the many people uh, who have devoted their careers uh, and lives uh, to development of these standards at the national level and who work in the trenches around institutions uh, like the University of Minnesota and Utah and uh, uh, around the country uh, who are uh, dedicated professionals that um, don't always I get the limelight, but who uh, provide an essential function that maintains the safety of uh, clinical research to a large extent and, and maintains public trust to a large degree, at least, uh, in the enterprise that we're involved in. So part of this claim, too, is that I think these ethical standards that are uh, represented to a certain extent in the, the federal regulations uh, and how they've been uh, implemented through guidance in many institutions. They're part of the fabric of how research is conducted at this point. And my uh, observation is that IRBs are not in a position at this point uh, typically of sort of frequently batting away, disapproving studies that are um, uh, plainly unethical in their design. That our institution that has several thousand active protocols probably disapproves um, half a dozen uh, a year. We can work with investigators almost always in circumstances to improve the quality and safety uh, of those studies, and very rarely are they disapproved. And my guess is that other institutions around the country have a very similar sort of experience. So it's those folks who are the sponsors of research, who are the investigators, and perhaps uh, even most importantly, who are those mid-level people, the research coordinators, who uh, have uh, incorporated this set of standards into their professional DNA and the protocols that come forward to the IRB uh, rarely represent what we would say is plainly unethical uh, protocol. So this is an enormous accomplishment. Now lots of ethical issues remain, uh, but I would say that a lot of those ethical issues are due to the fact that we have yet to develop adequate standards in certain domains of research. We're still thinking about them, we're still debating them, we're still uncertain about the right way to go, uh, as opposed to uh, the common conduct of uh, unethical research by contemporary standards. Now, exceptions uh, exist, of course. I'm going to talk a little bit about the so-called uh, you know, bad egg, bad apple uh, phenomenon uh, in a little bit. And I think there also are bad IRBs out there. There's no question about that either. And there are good IRBs that make bad mistakes. 
all of this part of the human experience, and I think part of what we need to do as institutions is try to make those mistakes uh, as uh, rare uh, as we can, to learn from the mistakes when we make them so that we can uh, uh, improve our function and improve the function of our peers by sharing that information in ways that uh, we all can learn together about uh, how things can go wrong. <clears throat> so here's my... Uh, uh, diagram about the pillars of research, sort of stool analogy. Got research ethics on the top. So three things that support this enterprise. Uh, the integrity of the investigator. None of this works without the investigator having integrity to do what he or she uh, uh, is supposed to do. Belmont principles we're familiar with and peer review. So I'm going to try to pick examples from each of these and talk a little bit about what I think some of the contemporary issues are uh, that... Uh, uh, we need to think more about in these particular domains. <clears throat> All right, peer review, institutional uh, review uh, boards. So we have now the notice of proposed uh, rulemaking, all 500 some pages of it that uh, maybe some of you had an opportunity to read through. Part of my contention with how this is laid out, and I'm going to be um, fairly critical of the NPRM with a number of my comments today, but I will also say that I think it has a number of excellent elements in there that do need to be uh, uh, supported and uh, promoted. But I think the section of the NPRM that relates to IRBs, uh, for me, uh, illustrates at least that uh, in the debate about how the regulations ought to change, there was not a whole lot of focus on any fundamental restructuring of the IRB system that a lot of the focus is on efficiency issues rather than efficacy. Now, talk, uh, you know, thankfully, perhaps I'm not talking almost at all today about biospecimens, um, but that's sort of one area in which folks are trying to reorganize some of the thinking around the, the principles and protection of subjects, uh, et cetera. But for the most part, a lot of the IRB changes are in the efficiency domain that people now see perhaps with the, maybe the pendulum has swung too far. Yes, indeed, we're doing a pretty good job or excellent job protecting human subjects, but maybe with a giant wet blanket that is uh, uh, suppressing a lot of creative uh, thought and work that um, is uh, inappropriate, or at least uh, hassling our investigators excessively for the, the benefit of particular interventions. And, and I think some of that certainly is uh, uh, true. Now, the single IRB proposal, uh, is, is an example. Folks are trying to move that as an efficiency argument much more than an efficacy argument. Now we've got a SACART meeting over the next uh, two days where we're going to finalize our recommendations on the NPRM uh, and uh, we'll see how that goes but I'm pretty confident what we're going to say is that uh, we don't like the single IRB idea. So it'll be interesting, maybe there'll be some conversation about that particular. And we don't like it, not because it's intrinsically a bad idea, it's probably intrinsically a good idea for a lot of different types of research. But we don't really know at this point, we don't have the data. This is a domain in which, in a world we're trying to emphasize data-driven decisions, uh, we've made potentially a quite large decision about how research is conducted with virtually no data about uh, how well that works or not. And I think many of us who are in the uh, research oversight business recognize that the IRB is just one committee these days among quite a few that's part of that oversight function and centralizing the IRB doesn't centralize a lot of these other functions. So I think from SACCARP's point of view, from my point of view, it's an open question whether this will, how much this will work to improve efficiency and how much it should be appropriate for two center studies, three center studies, uh, studies in which there are uh, legitimate local um, or institutional uh, prerogatives that ought to be uh, entertained. A lot of our research, a lot of my research works with health departments. Health departments have their own IRBs. I can guarantee you the health department is not interested in deferring to an academic medical center for their uh, oversight, nor are we interested in deferring to their uh, IRB. So there are those kinds of examples out there that ought to uh, help guide in that. All right, so that's a little bit of a, uh, a side issue uh, here, but a, a major one that will transform this whole uh, domain if that does indeed uh, become part of the final rule. The new excluded categories, again, uh, largely efficiency uh, issues. There have been longstanding complaints by a lot of folks in uh, some uh, social science uh, uh, domains who've not felt that the IRB system serves their interests, uh, and uh, things like eliminating continuing review for a variety of projects. All good ideas to try to uh, improve the efficiency and also potentially improve efficacy. And I think part of the rationale here is to take the uh, 
Um, separate the wheat from the chaff. Don't have IRBs with uh, all of the expertise around that table. Spend a lot of time on uh, a lot of the protocols that don't really need to be uh, evaluated. Let's focus on those that really require the attention for human subject protections. So here's just a couple of ideas about the efficiency uh, issue, and um, no doubt others uh, uh, with lots of experience have uh, more uh, ideas uh, as well. I think the, re the, the regs permit a fair amount of flexibility with efficiency issues. I don't think the regs lock us into uh, uh, necessarily a, uh, a burdensome set of functions. And I would say there's a couple of simple things that uh, have been widely recognized around the field. Um, if you have a limited investment in this enterprise, then you're likely to have an inefficient system. And where, does that in where should that investment go? I think IT systems in this day and age are essential. You ought to have a paperless system that uh, allows transfer of information in uh, uh, prompt and efficient ways and allows you to track your numbers about how your uh, uh, institution is functioning. Uh, in addition, and this is probably much more important, you need to invest in the people in the process. You've got to have enough people for one, but you also have to have uh, longevity and expertise with those folks who are working with you. There's nothing more damaging than uh, high turnover within the IRB uh, office. You need professionals there who uh, are steeped uh, in, your, uh, in the regs, in their institutional experience, who know the investigators uh, in the community. Uh, and so investing in those professionals is absolutely essential, I think, to an efficient uh, organization. And then simply poor management, uh, pretty straightforward. You got poor management, then you're gonna have poor uh, efficiency. Sometimes I think this is reflected in uh, some institutions that have what I would consider to be uh, highly risk averse uh, behavior. Uh, inability to move things uh, forward uh, in an efficient fashion due to over concerns about risk in, so, in some uh, domains. Uh, I mentioned already on the second bullet, use of electronic systems, staff support, uh, and an ability to focus on what are really the high risk, more complex protocols. <clears throat> Supporting expert review. How do you get the right people around the table? I don't have, certainly don't have any magic uh, bullets uh, here for sure. We struggle with this very much at our uh, institution to get the right people around the, the table, and oftentimes it's those folks who are doing the most clinical research who then claim, well, with our clinical load and our research load, we don't have time to spend it on the IRB. Uh, and that's a problem. You know, if you don't have time to spend it on the IRB, maybe you don't have time to do an adequate job with the conduct of clinical research either. Um, so you gotta get domain-specific expertise and match that with uh, a recognition of what the ethical standards are. Regulatory standards, but sort of the general ethical standards in this particular domain. And that's hard. This takes a lot of time. It's a time investment, and folks uh, uh, have so little time for so uh, many things uh, in this day and age. So here's some thoughts about uh, points to consider for the, these expertise uh, uh, issues. Incentives. Money's always a good incentive. Um, I don't actually know or uh, have a good sense of what the national standard is. I think a lot of IRBs are paying chairs and vice chairs uh, these days, but I don't know that. I think that's a nice contribution to uh, that, even when it doesn't make up a, a large proportion of their academic salary, it's a meaningful commitment of the institution to these people. Uh, we currently don't pay our uh, members on the IRB. We've got about a, 100 members these days, uh, but that may well be a consideration uh, down the road. I think from an institutional standpoint, it sets some concerning uh, precedents in that there's lots of people who work very hard on lots of committees uh, who typically uh, are expected to do so as part of their professional service. So uh, I think that this is a, a challenging area, but certainly one for consideration. Um, IRB service ought to be particularly strong uh, element uh, in the retention, promotion, and tenure process. And I wouldn't say necessarily that we as an institution have done a, a particularly or an exemplary job with this, but we ought to figure out ways in which people see this as a very important contribution to professional service and it shines as part of their uh, curriculum vitae as that goes forward for these sorts of considerations. I think we can uh, help people with their uh, institutional stature by uh, including them as uh, instructors and mentors within their departmental uh, environment. They should be seen as somebody who has expertise and stature because of this service. Uh, and I think as we educate our IRB members, uh, 
we shouldn't <clears throat> try to be as creative as possible and make those as interesting as possible. So we tr always try to throw in what are the contemporary debates, what are the conceptual issues that people want to grapple with. And these are such smart, uh, talented folks that uh, they uh, really enjoy the opportunity to sort of think through what the contemporary issues are as opposed to sort of simply you know, walking through uh, the regs in a, uh, what might be a, a less than stimulating fashion. From an investigator standpoint, uh, huge challenge, but I think we ought to increasingly try to get investigators to write protocols in ways that you don't need an expert to read it. We're focused really on the human subjects issues here. You have to know the science. Somebody has to know the science to a certain extent, but so frequently what we see is investigators will take their NIH application, copy it, and paste it uh, into the IRB application, and if you're not an ophthalmologist, who can understand what ophthalmologists write about? I mean, it's just uh, uh, too dense. So we ought to encourage, it ought to be a, a process of writing, which is difficult, that ought to be accessible to everybody around the table so that they understand the science, the intent, the design of the study, uh, et cetera. A big challenge. And then here's uh, probably the bigger leverage that we have uh, resorted to on occasion, which is to say, if your department can't find people to help service, to help provide service on the IRB, then there will be implications for how quickly and efficiently the protocols from your department will be reviewed. And if you only have one oncologist on one panel, we're gonna put the oncology protocols to that panel, and we're not gonna ask that person to do more than three reviews uh, a month, and if they stack up, that's the consequence. Now that's bad from an institutional statistical standpoint and how efficient we are, but on the other hand, departments get it, and it's like, okay, we will find somebody to help uh, uh, support the IRB in order to help uh, our community move its research protocols uh, uh, forward. All right, a different challenge here. This one related to the pillar of uh, the Belmont uh, principles. <clears throat> Respect for persons, informed consent. And here's the language from the uh, Belmont report about uh, linking the notion of respect for persons to uh, the ability of people to choose what's going to happen to them in the conduct of research. So there's really this long-standing recognition uh, that uh, informed consent uh, is broken. Uh, my point here is that the term broken tends to suggest you had something to begin with, right? You had this beautiful lamp and the, the cat knocked it off this. That's not how it's been. We've never gotten this right. Informed consent is one of these challenges that I personally, and I think a lot of folks in the community, have underestimated for a long period of time the true complexity of achieving the, the stated goals that were part of the uh, Nuremberg list, part of the Belmont principles, part of uh, every bedrock principle of uh, research ethics includes informed consent, but yet we don't we do a very good job with this. And part of it is, I think, the interests of virtually every participant in the clinical research environment is rewarded for a complicated consent process, except for the participants themselves. Sponsors like it because it uh, puts all the information in there. Liability issues uh, be a concern. Same thing for the investigators. There's no downside for them to put it all in there because you told people it's right here on page uh, 18. Um, <clears throat> IRBs don't necessarily push back either. When I first joined the IRB, it was going to be, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back. I'm going to make a big deal of this issue. And it, and it quickly became, well, every investigator rewriting every consent form, and it's gonna, it just throws a huge wrench in the whole process. And pretty soon it's like, okay, unless it's particularly egregious, uh, we're going to let it go, and maybe we'll pick a couple words in the consent form that are uh, 20 syllables and make them break that into two words. So everybody's incentivized by the system, uh, by the system in order to make it complicated. So what do we know about comprehension and what, what the regs have to say about this? So this first quote up here is from the, the common rule. Information that's given to subject uh, or the representative shall be in a language understandable to the subject or the representative. Now in part that means if your participants speak Spanish, you ought to have a Spanish language form and process. That's pretty, pretty obvious. But what OHRP has also interpreted this to mean is that um, 
you really should not be talking in graduate level language for people who are uh, grade school uh, education. But yet this being the sole language in the common rule about this issue, OHRP has no leverage. They're not going to step into an institution and say, you will be sanctioned because the language in this consent form is just over the top. It's not happened and it's not likely to happen. So part of what's happening with the, well, I'll contrast this just quickly with the um, Declaration of uh, Helsinki, and there is some better language in there. Um, subject must be uh, adequately informed and uh, after ensuring that the subject has understood. So at least there's this notion here that there's an ethical obligation to make people actually to ascertain whether people really understand what you just told them. So here's what the NPRM has to say about it. And I won't read the whole thing, but I've got a couple things highlighted. These are my highlights. Um, a reasonable person uh, would want to have. So it's going towards a reasonable person standards. It says basically you don't need to put everything conceivable, every conceivable risk in this consent form. What do reasonable people want to know? This is the clinical standard, of course, for informed consent. And so it's translating that clinical standard into the research environment. I think this makes uh, tremendous sense. Now, given the incentives, I don't know whether it's going to work, but uh, uh, it makes sense. Opportunity to discuss the information, it says. And then it also says facilitates the prospective subject or representative's understanding. So here, bringing in language similar sort of dec declaration of Helsinki to provide some obligation to, again, make sure people actually understand what you're saying. This, I think, is included, and, uh, and pretty much OHRP has been straightforward about this. Part of the rationale for this language is to give OHRP a potential hook, to be able to come into an institutional environment and say, this informed consent uh, form and process you've got for this study is uh, truly terrible. And nobody would understand this, and therefore uh, we may take some form of uh, action, uh, action, perhaps a, a letter, whatever, uh, to highlight uh, the regulatory oversight of this process, which for the most part has been absent other than sort of counting whether the elements of consent uh, have been included in the form or not. So this slide really is just a representation of this problem uh, from uh, recent trials, the support trial uh, of uh, uh, preemies, and this was uh, sent to me whoops, uh, by uh, it's got a mind of its own. Give you time to read this uh, again and again. <laughs> no, it seems to be going backwards uh, in time. <clears throat> there we go. I think we're heading forwards now. Okay, St uh, there. So uh, from Mark uh, uh, Kaiser, and so here's what the IRBs said is their goal. We like. Uh, seventh or eighth grade uh, language in the consent forms. Uh, a lot of our uh, policies and procedures say that. Uh, here's what the actual reading levels uh, were uh, on the right-hand side of this uh, graph. All difficult, all institutions, and I'm not picking on the ones listed here in particular. This is the one that uh, Dr. Alkaiser happened to, to look at. Utah's wasn't any better or worse. Uh, it was pretty much the, uh, the same. So we just don't, uh, illustrating once again, uh, we simply don't do a particularly good job uh, in this domain. So why is this so hard? And I think it's been my impression, I, when I came on to, to be chair of uh, uh, SACHARP, my big issue was going to be informed consent. I really wanted to make an impact on this, and because of the lack of regulatory hook here, we have made some nice recommendations on uh, informed consent and minimal risk research, but we haven't done uh, made any significant progress uh, in the, the overall uh, domain. And part of it is my recognition, uh, which perhaps has come a bit late, this isn't simply a matter of kind of why don't we just take a two by four to the head of these investigators and IRB people and we'll fix this. Well, that's the, it's, not, it's not fixable in that sense, that the problems associated with comprehension in this complex domain are far greater than simply rewriting the form uh, at an eighth grade level and throwing some pictures uh, uh, in there. And, and part of this challenge is um, this therapeutic misconception, which I think is such an interesting and powerful uh, phenomenon. And this is Charles Litz uh, uh, and colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> this part is sort of looking at how much the people understand uh, this slide uh, about uh, research protocols. And I'll just go through this uh, uh, pretty quickly. Um, 
24% of people reported no risks or disadvantages to research participation. 46% uh, told uh, the interview about the risks associated with experimental intervention, so about uh, a little less than half. And then, uh, but only 13% could report any disadvantages from the design itself in terms of randomization, placebos, double blind, uh, et cetera. So just illustrating how it is that people, many people, not all, have fundamental challenges with understanding core issues. So uh, their conclusion, the results of this research suggest that subjects often sign consents to participate in clinical trials with only the most modest appreciation of the risks and disadvantages of participation. Well, here's the hook, of course. Um, people sign up anyhow. And I think if the structure of people's minds was such that they said, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not going to sign up for this thing until I have a good understanding of what this whole enterprise is about. Well, for some reason, that doesn't happen. People sign up anyhow. And so that seriously undercuts the incentives we have to try to do a better job to get people to understand this stuff. In fact, it might work to the detriment of the recruitment enterprise. Now, maybe it works to the advantage of the retention enterprise. I don't know. But that's an impure question to think about. Uh, but people sign up anyhow. So here's a little bit more about this notion of therapeutic misconception, which I think is certainly part of, the, part of this explanation and part of the landscape. Uh, misconception described as occurring when the research subject failing to grasp the distinction between the imperatives of clinical research and ordinary treatment. Uh, inaccurately attributes a prim primacy of therapeutic intent and in individual care typically seen in uh, ordinary clinical settings to the research. So they don't understand the difference between research and clinical care. This is what my doctor thinks is best for me, is signing me up in this clinical uh, uh, trial. Now this particular study, and uh, particular study, um, again, Charles, it's 62% uh, of the subjects they were looking at believed either the treatment and research would be individualized or they had uh, what they deemed to be unreasonable assessment of benefits. All right, so what do we know about how, how to do a better job in this regard? Uh, this is Alan Tate's uh, uh, work from just a couple years ago, uh, pediatric context, and they looked at a variety of different aspects of consent forms, and this is just one of a modest-sized literature on these sorts of issues, and basically found that by combining a bunch of attributes that you could improve uh, uh, comprehension. Larger fonts, more white space and bolding, underlining graphical presentation of risk, here is helpful for folks to understand. So many folks don't understand what 5% means. That uh, Illustrating, of course, in this fashion can be helpful uh, for folks. So we're making progress, but none of this is revolutionary. You don't go from 20% understanding to 80% with these sorts of tools. Statistically significant, but still uh, somewhat marginal. How about audiovisual sorts of, uh, they've proven not to be uh, as revolutionary again as we might think. Uh, Palmer uh, et al, 2012, uh, looked at the literature. At least partial benefits were seen from multimedia presentations in 16 of 20 uh, reviewed studies. Uh, thus it appears multimedia consent tools often have at least partial utility in the consent process. So it's hard. We haven't figured this out uh, yet. The therapeutic misconception, I think, is just a fascinating uh, issue and speaks to the psychological complexity of the consent uh, process. Uh, I think we can do a better job with revising forms for simplicity and processability and graphical presentation. These are things that we can, we can uh, do um, if uh, adequately motivated. Multimedia, looking promising, uh, particularly in this day and age where everybody's got their phone out all the time and they know how to uh, access uh, material. And what I haven't mentioned yet is this notion of teach back, where you ask folks, so tell me uh, about what you understand uh, this research to be about. You have a few core questions, and when they uh, can't express back to you an uh, adequate answer, then you go over it uh, again, this teach back phenomenon. And, and this interaction between participant and investigator uh, is probably one of the key elements to help improve uh, comprehension. It's that human interaction that's proven to be uh, that much more um, helpful. So IRBs, I think, need to be very flexible. People are going to be coming forward increasingly with innovative ways to do informed consent. I very much want IRBs to be open to that. Uh, and uh, the old uh, academic saw uh, 
Uh, we need more research. All right. So here's some new informed consent uh, uh, challenges uh, that I think are uh, uh, fascinating to, uh, to grapple with. Uh, what we're seeing now is um, a change in how research is conducted. For the most part, the consent issues were developed in an era when you had the investigator sitting down with the participant, and you're talking about what's the nature of this study, fairly straightforward interpersonal interaction. Well, a lot of research now is being done um, where the investigator is removed in time and place from the subject. So it's big data studies. Biospecimens, um, I had to mention the word, uh, is part of that. Randomized, uh, or cluster randomized trials, uh, another real challenge. What's the role of individual decision making? From a personal standpoint, I think we need to be thinking more about management structures for the uh, research and the resources that will help protect human subjects and, and that the role of individual uh, choice and consent is probably going to be less. But we haven't figured out what that new model uh, is really going to look like. All right. <clears throat> Belmont report challenges. Individuals with impaired decision-making capacity. Uh, and I'm probably talking a little too long, so I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time with this. Scott Kim is going to talk about this uh, next in a much more comprehensive uh, way. This is a particularly interesting topic. Uh, and it gets to respect for persons in terms of consent issues, beneficence, how much risks will be posed on people who can't choose for themselves, uh, and justice. When is it okay to enroll people who can't choose? Uh, potentially when you may have other subjects who can uh, help you answer the, the research question. This has been a large gap in the research regs for many years. The NPRM, sadly, does not try to fill this gap. Again, what a wonderful opportunity after 25 years to redo the regs. Uh, why not? Uh, tackle this issue of uh, individuals with uh, impaired decision-making capacity. Probably the single largest and most important vulnerable group out there, and particularly as many baby boomers like me are moving into that age where uh, cognitive uh, issues are going to be uh, uh, important. So a couple of the basic issues. Uh, um, who should decide about research participation? Uh, when is it that people can decide for themselves? How do you gauge the risk of the research and the complexity of the research with an individual cognitive capacity in order to uh, decide when they can't make a choice for themselves? Uh, probably project specific as opposed to a global phenomenon. Uh, legally authorized representatives, uh, state law uh, has variability uh, in this regard. Uh, and assent, what's the role of assent? Or do we want to have a parallel sort of structure with this population the way we do with kids? Um, we let kids who are a little bit older make decisions about their participation with the simple process. Uh, maybe uh, we should be developing and expecting something uh, similar with uh, this population of uh, potentially vulnerable individuals. Uh, and people, of course, with changing levels of capacity. What do you do when you have somebody who's progressively losing capacity during the conduct of the study or maybe improving it uh, uh, over time? So SACCARP uh, looked at this issue a couple years ago, um, and uh, there was a subcommittee called CIDR. I think uh, Barbara Beer was uh, a chair when this uh, came through. This was, uh, I was on the subcommittee at the time. This was probably the most enjoyable uh, academic enterprise I've been involved. It was just a fascinating set of discussion, and such a conflict between different communities, different issues on that uh, group. There were folks in the mental health community who very much wanted to say, we don't want to cap on risk here because that will uh, inhibit extremely valuable research in this particular domain. Where others wanted to say, this is a vulnerable population. If you don't have a prospect of direct benefit for these folks, you cannot or should not uh, confer a substantial benefit on these people. Why not a parallel system, again, to what uh, we've done uh, in the pediatric realm? So uh, what uh, SACARP had to say, and I would very much encourage folks who are interested in this issue to take a look at what uh, the SACARP statement, because I think it's particularly uh, uh, good. So uh, that previous slide was basically just to say um, we were advocating a minor increase over minimal risk standard for research in which there was not a prospect of uh, uh, benefit for folks, but with an opportunity to go above that uh, level in certain circumstances. So this is an area in which institutions really need to develop their own policies and procedures uh, to address this uh, issue because we don't have uh, uh, regulatory guidance. All right, investigator integrity. As we all know, 
the process, uh, the entire enterprise depends on the investigator doing what he or she is supposed to do. Uh, and that's a uh, basic understanding of the um, ethical standards, compliance with the regulatory requirements, and probably as importantly, ethical guides or fiber to be able to make decisions in the trenches when uh, the unusual or unanticipated issue comes up, right? It's not all about the IRB. It's about what do you do when this happens in the, in the research uh, uh, clinic, and you've got to make a choice about how to deal with that in an ethically appropriate uh, way. So I think one of the most uh, serious threats to the whole human subject enterprise is that investigator who lacks an adequate maybe moral compass in certain circumstances, but in other circumstances uh, is simply so focused on the science and potentially so disorganized, which is one of the phenomena we've seen, that they can't maintain um, appropriate standards in the conduct of research. And anybody who's been involved in any sort of administrative job or maybe even in any family knows that uh, you spend 95% of your time on 5% of the people. And these are that 5%. So how do we deal with those? folks. Uh, how do we deal with that overall structure? I think it's a critical uh, issue in the conduct of research. Um, a colleague and I, a dozen years ago, submitted a grant application that says we want to see how IRBs are addressing uh, the bad actor and want to see what sort of sanctions are appropriate in those sorts of circumstances. Uh, and the review, we didn't even get scored. They said, well, IRBs can do whatever they want. It's not an interesting question. Well, I, I think it is an interesting question given academic freedom, given uh, uh, the lifeblood that research uh, uh, constitutes for faculty members. One has to be very careful about uh, clamping down on individuals inappropriately. On the other hand, when you see a consistent pattern of misbehavior by people as an institution, you need to figure out how to respond to that. So uh, federal regulations govern institutions, uh, not um, individuals. Uh, really nothing specific in the common rule about investigators. The President's Commission called for uh, uh, something within the regulations that spoke to the requirements of the inv individuals, uh, investigators, and not uh, uh, purely with the institutions in which they reside. Uh, Sackharp commented on this uh, uh, in January uh, 2013. And again, I think this was developed under uh, Barber's leadership, uh, perhaps passed uh, uh, under mine. Um, and we wanted to see some uh, additions to the common rule. Uh, again, not reflected in the NPR uh, M, uh, unfortunately. And this is just a, a little bit of language from that statement that reflects uh, where we thought the regulations uh, ought to go. So let me finish with, so, so those are sort of, some of them kind of inside ball issues, although I think large uh, enough that everybody recognizes how important they are in the, in the conduct of these issues. So this really isn't, uh, hopefully not too deep in the weeds. I'm gonna step back for a second and really uh, with this last side, suggest what I think a much broader problem is, which is outside the orbit of the IRB and the human subject research protection programs. And it's how research, clinical, a lot of clinical research is conducted and the role of industry uh, in uh, designing the trials, paying FDA for uh, reviews. Some folks have said FDA considers the uh, industry to be a, uh, a, a client and a customer uh, that they need to keep happy. Um, and in uh, the most uh, concerning sorts of circumstances, data isn't analyzed uh, purely in ways that promote the, uh, the product uh, and not uh, independent review of the science for the welfare of uh, uh, individuals. Uh, and they may take a very active role in uh, writing the papers uh, in ways that uh, promote the product. And I think the literature is pretty clear uh, in this domain. Industry sponsorship is associated with substantially better uh, outcomes in terms of the uh, attractiveness of industry products than non-industry sponsored uh, clinical research. This is a huge uh, issue. Folks like Marge Angel have been speaking about this for a while, proposing rather radical solutions to uh, create a whole new uh, institute at the federal level that would conduct uh, uh, clinical research, but we haven't solved this uh, problem. And if we're thinking about ways in which there are threats to human subjects uh, due to, in this uh, context, a very large conflict of interest. Uh, I think we need much more thought as a society about this uh, particular issue. So, oh, you missed a, 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 a glimpse of Utah. So thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Jeff. Okay, uh, we are open for business on questions. I may get some webcast questions coming through those curtains, and we have roving mics. So I think, where are our roving mics? There's a hand right here, right in the middle, this gentleman. Can you get him a mic, please? And if you wouldn't mind identifying yourself, that would be great. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Nate Shiner. I'm a uh, third year medical student here at the university and a student of the Master of Arts program in bioethics here. Oh, wonderful. Um, so my question is, uh, do you think that the federal regulations um, encourage the therapeutic misconception in the way that they discuss the prospect of direct benefit? And I'm thinking about what you had on um, slide 27 uh, there of your presentation. Um, where, for example, we might have a researcher who's conducting, say, a, like a phase three um, study on like an Alzheimer's drug, and they're thinking, oh yeah, I think my drug might have some direct benefit for this um, patient, and all of a sudden now we've got the informed consent discussion framed in terms of there might be a potential benefit. Yeah, great question, and I do think that um, the discussion uh, oftentimes in the context of the consent process may well uh, foster the therapeutic Misconception. I'm not sure that. Not sure, yeah. I'm not sure that that's always uh, the fault of the investigator, since the prospective benefits, of course, have to be part of that consent process. So it's probably more a matter of how do you balance that language in an appropriate way, so that folks understand more broadly that the point of the enterprise is not the benefit of the uh, participant, uh, but to answer a scientific question, and that's such a hard challenge for folks to understand. So I think that it's the balanced uh, approach to uh, benefit versus uh, risk versus scientific uh, background that's es essential there to try to work uh, against the therapeutic misconception. Okay, we've got one question here and then another one right there. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeff. Thanks for a great talk. Steve, Steve Jaffe from University of Pennsylvania. Early on you talked about um, SACARPs and your view sort of against this requirement that single IRBs be required to review multi-center trials. A little bit later, you talked about one of the problems being scientific expertise on IRBs and the lack of scientific expertise to review some sorts of studies. And it struck me that one solution to the scientific, ex to the scientific expertise problem is to require single IRB review of multi-center trials where that single IRB must have the expertise to review that particular kind of trial. Would that be an argument back against your sort of concerns about multi-center trials being reviewed by single IRBs? Yes, uh, I think it would. And I think where, so um, just to be clear where I want to be or with my comments about single IRB, I do think there are a number of circumstances in which there will be uh, uh, increased efficiency and increased quality of review due significantly to uh, uh, the decreased oversight and the ability to uh, pack an IRB with uh, folks with appropriate expertise. So if you really have a, uh, a network uh, uh, set of studies on uh, neurologic disorders, for example, the IRB can be fully uh, staffed with individuals who have the appropriate expertise from a variety of different perspectives to answer those questions. So I think that's exactly right. And what, we would hope, what I would hope to see is uh, the data coming out of those sorts of experiences that do indeed show uh, here is how um, the time frame has been uh, lessened, and here's how we've reduced the uh, sort of ridiculous activities uh, about wordsmithing that uh, all IRBs uh, love to do and create just havoc for sponsors of trials. So I think it's a, a good example of where this uh, might work in many circumstances. Okay. Joe Gunstan, I'm a computer science professor here. And for background, I, I think it's fair to say that the IRB has determined that all of my research has no benefit to the <laughs> participants. Um, but I want to push you on this issue of direct benefit and therapeutic misconception, because it seems like the hardwired into humans from the story of Adam and Eve to the reason people you know, gave their money to Madoff is the idea that forbidden fruit is remarkably tempting. And if you're facing typically a medical problem, the forbidden fruit of the, this is the only way you get this drug, is hugely tempting. And yet it feels like the regulations are all saying that direct benefit is something that is only weighing on the one side. That without direct benefit, there are these people you might not be able to enroll, but direct benefit makes that okay. And I've seen nothing that says that direct benefit uh, should elevate the concerns about informed consent. And I'm wondering if you have any opinion on whether 
that benefit is something that should trigger, among other things, perhaps more aggressive testing of whether the person really understands the risks and not only, you know, the potential light at the end of the tunnel. I guess I would uh, probably go uh, maybe a little bit the other way in that I think our ethical concerns about the conduct of trials is usually greater when there's no prospect of benefit and folks really ought to understand. So I think the therapeutic misconception is probably most problematic where you're doing the research purely for scientific uh, information but yet folks misinterpret the purpose to be for their particular benefit. That's a, that's a, a dramatic misconception of the nature of the enterprise that they're getting involved in. And I think in that circumstance, you ought to have a fairly high expectation that folks uh, understand that. Now, <clears throat> probably depends on the risk of the study itself. And we had this conversation as part of SACARP, and we had uh, Charles Litz there and asked him the question. He said, so let's imagine you have a teach-back circumstance and the, the participant doesn't understand key elements of the protocol, or perhaps has the therapeutic misconception where you can't seem to get past that. Should that person not be enrolled in the study? And uh, there was a lot of sort of uncertainty uh, about that uh, question. And the final answer was, well, you know, it probably depends just on the risk of the study. If it's a high-risk study, if you're talking about an oncology trial, then it prob you probably need to work a little harder to get that person to understand the issue before you should enroll them. Uh, if it's a low-risk study, um, then uh, maybe you can allow folks with that misconception to, to move uh, forward. So, you know, I think the, the benefit issue is um, probably most problematic because of the ability of folks, or what research tends to show is that people exaggerate the probability of benefit. Now, we all, we, of course, we all do that all the time. You know, when you buy a lottery ticket, it's going to be you're the one <laughs> that's much more likely than uh, your neighbor to, to hit on that. Um, and so, you know, there's a sense that uh, somehow uh, things are going to work for you. And this is true in the clinical arena uh, as well. You know, you tell folks you've got a 10% probability of uh, benefiting from something, um, you know, 50% of people will think they're, they're in that 10%. And so I think we need to be, have creative ways of being honest about how the conversation goes. And when you have a phase one uh, oncology trial where there's a very low percentage of prospect of benefit, Maybe enough to call a prospect a benefit, but people ought to understand that chances are very high that it's not going to work uh, in a meaningful way. Okay, uh, Scott, you have a question. Uh, the webcast people are asking me to repeat the questions, so I'll do the best I can. Mm. Okay. Um, okay. Jeff, you used the analogy of the lottery just then, and I just this is a common end question, I guess, is that when we talk about the therapeutic misconception, you, you, the definition you gave was this dense paragraph. It's very complicated. And I believe that we have very poor ability to measure people's understanding and often mistake people's motivations for statement, statements of understanding. So I'll just say back to you, when you buy a lottery ticket and you have this feeling you're gonna win, do you really believe that the lottery is set up to benefit you directly? So the, the question sure is putting Jeff on the spot. Uh, asking about the therapeutic misconception and whether even Scott, whether Jeff himself, all of us, when we sign up for research or buy a lottery ticket, don't secretly think, well, I might score. This might be for my benefit. Yeah. Um, Do you believe the purpose is to benefit individuals? Um, so are you asking whether, in fact, it's not a misconception at all that, in fact, all of us are hoping that the participants in the research will, in fact, uh, benefit uh, because we want everybody wants to be uh, successful. And so, um, I get. Well, excellent point. And so, th the point being uh, that doesn't mean we're misunderstanding the purpose. I guess perhaps. Uh, more dialogue necessary, but maybe the part of the answer would be that there are layered purposes, and that the first purpose really does have to be how safe and effective is this intervention? Uh, and answering that question is the, the critical thing, uh, and if it doesn't benefit people, it's as, as critical to, to understand and know that. Now, hoping that it benefits folks um, is uh, in, entirely consistent with the enterprise, too, uh, as long as folks um, are not 
led down the path uh, to say, um, this is the best thing for you clinically, and so let's uh, enroll you in this uh, uh, research protocol. So I think your point's very well taken that if there's subtleties to the psychology uh, here that um, illustrates why this is such a problem, both from what people hear as well as what we or investigators say uh, to people because we're kind of promoting that same concept. Okay. So the good news is that Jeff will be back. Uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break now. Do use both sides of the